Hello, and welcome to a special Thanksgiving episode of Bitcoin in Asia, coming to you this week from Vietnam, where Thanksgiving is not celebrated. We have a fun conversation this week. Was excited to get back with Dominic Whale and Phoe Nguyen, the co-founders of Bitcoin Vietnam, the first exchange uh, to roll up locally here in Ho Chi Minh, as well as Bitcoin Saigon, the first Bitcoin meetup, um, both of which they co-founded in 2013. We really weave through the history of Bitcoin in Vietnam, the business developments, community developments um, over the last five years, some interesting tidbits about operating a Bitcoin business here, about operating a business here generally, the Vietnam market uh, generally, dealing with regulators, dealing with central bankers, navigating the bull market and the ICO craze of 2017 as a Bitcoin-focused company and regulatory developments in the last couple of years. So it was, a, it was a fun conversation. Dominic is a Bitcoin OG out here in Asia and has been holding down the fort in Vietnam for five years now. So it was fun to hear some of his stories. I hope you'll enjoy it. Uh, sitting here in the offices of the Bitcoin conglomerate of Vietnam, uh, Bitcoin Vietnam, nice, nice view of, uh, of the river from District 4. District 4, yes. Yeah, sitting here with Dominic and Thumb. Yeah. Thumb. Uh, so, welcome. Uh, well, thank you for welcoming me. I appreciate you having me in the office. First time here. Welcome, John. Thanks. Uh, so, I guess just to, to kick things off, um, kind of take us back to when you first um, kind of got into Bitcoin and uh, kind of how this all kicked off initially. Okay, that was for me 26th of November 2012. Mm. Uh, I know the exact date because I recently just looked it up, it's about chat history. <laughs> which was by our also nowadays co-founder Alex who first introduced me to Bitcoin. And yeah, like you can imagine, there are also all these new questions like who's making it, who's issuing it and whatever. Yeah. Luckily, I kind of stuck around with it and was digging it deeper and deeper over the weeks following up after this. So I think it was like early 13 then where I started buying the my first Bitcoins. Uh, also the, Regretted so far. <laughs> yeah, it was a wild ride. I remember we had like the first bubble in around like the Cyprus crisis, which we had in Europe, which was in Europe a pretty big deal because Cyprus is a country in the European Union. Yeah. Like basically just took out like half of the money of people's bank accounts. And at this time you're in Frankfurt. I was still in Frankfurt at the time. Uh, and they yeah, basically to have your use case already. So, like mm -hmm. money which cannot just be taken by the government, but you need it. Uh, that was pretty visible there that there is a need moving forward. If you kind of have followed like this whole Europe rise and where it's all heading, uh, and that was kind of the direction I was pulled to already before I got into Bitcoin. So um, that's what it made initially already quite interesting to me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that's where it started out for me. Yeah, so you're, so you're there, you're working, you're kind of corporate finance or, or uh, yeah, kind of Frank corporate Ford, in Frankfurt. Um, yeah, yeah, relatively irrelevant job there, just probably the wheel in the moment and everything else. So, uh, when I started digging deeper into it, uh, so like after three months, I mean, you have all these questions, of course, you're very doubtful in the beginning, like, uh -huh. okay, how can this work, or whatever. But when you started digging deeper, you find the answers, it's like, oh, that stuff actually kind of makes sense, and then you find more answers which kind of make sense, and so your doubts are basically replaced really by excitement because like, hey, if this stuff really works, that's going to change the world. So after these three months, I knew already, okay, I got to quit my job. Mm. I have to get more into this. I mean, it still took then a year to actually quit my job, but it was clear to me at this point, okay, that's yeah. kind of like the internet way of our generation. You don't want to miss this. You want to be yeah. more involved in it. Yeah. Even if like purely financially, probably would have been better just to stay in your <laughs> job and keep buying Bitcoin. It's the dirty little secret that we're really into this stuff, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> for a lot of people, but uh, yeah, otherwise no regrets. I think like the last six, seven years now, I'm not sure that well, so it's almost seven years for me now, uh, the amount of new things you have learned, uh, 
the people you have met and everything. I mean, it's, it was worth it in this regard, yeah. Yeah, and so we're sitting here in Ho Chi Minh, uh, so you obviously didn't stay in Frankfurt. Uh, what, what kind of uh, initi initiated the, hey, I'm, I'm interested in getting into Bitcoin commercially, let's do it in Vietnam, let's start a business in Vietnam. Uh, how, how did that come, come to be? Okay, that's a bit longer story. So first, initially, wanted to get more involved, but it was like early 13, spring 30, roughly this time, so you remember it was a time where you could basically read almost every toast still a Bitcoin talk. It was yeah, yeah. a task which was not impossible to do. Uh, you had maybe in the mainstream media like two mentions per week or something. Everyone would freak out about it. Yeah, yeah so... Uh, and there was not even a community in Frankfurt yet. So that was mm -hmm. kind of the first thing we did. If you look at Bitcoin Talk, it's actually my account who like started like, hey, is there in and around Frankfurt? Okay. Any people who want to meet up? I mean, there was a few communities in Germany already, like in Berlin, and Stuttgart, they had mm -hmm. already something. It was like kind of weird that Frankfurt as like finance capital there. Mm -hmm. Didn't really have anything going. So we kicked this off. Um, some other people who were also already there, I mean, Alex, of course, got co founder here, but like CEO Goodman is probably also there, which some people might recognize. He also was around there. Uh, got together a bunch of people there. It was like the only way to meet other Bitcoiners, basically. Go to Bitcoin Talk and ask around. Mm -hmm. I was like, nobody in real life knew about Bitcoin back then. So yeah. It was like completely obscure to most people, never heard about it. Um, and I mean, at these early meetups, you had a lot of energy there because you had like this, this small group of people where everybody like saw the light basically. Everybody there knew, okay, that's going to change the world. Just everybody outside doesn't really know about it yet. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of energy. Every second person there tried to think about also, okay, how can we foster this project? Maybe build some business around it. Um, and I mean, the German communities back at the time, I think Germany was like probably the strongest country there in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. You still see it from to a certain degree that like, um, if you look, for example, at the node starts of Bitcoin, after the US Bitcoin nodes, those are run in Germany still. Mm -hmm. It's just that like, Germany is not a very innovation-friendly country. So there were a lot of people trying to build some projects, make all kinds of things work, but most of them just didn't work out in Germany. So the people who were really serious about it, they moved on the day back across the borders to mm. Zurich, London, Amsterdam. So they took a lot of like the German entrepreneurs in the space. Mm. All the people kind of just completely dropped out. So like the communities for like two years in Germany were really kind of dead between yeah. 15 and 17 because like all the people who were like leading the efforts there either moved elsewhere or... Any other folks who are still kind of really the mix from that group who, who left? I mean, the, time you did? the people are still kind of around. Uh, I was also just at the uh, Bitcoin Frankfurt meetup again. I mean, still going. Yeah. Uh, two months ago when I was visiting Frankfurt, we had there the guys from Morphin, of a Bitcoin, like this one firm which just announced last week now that they want to build in Texas, I believe, yeah, the yeah. largest okay. mining firm around the world. We should have bought some stocks of them when we started two months ago. It's <laughs> doubled while the Bitcoin price didn't do so well over the last two months. Anyway, <laughs> um, so I mean, there's still things happening. It's just that doing stuff in Germany is still incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we ran into the same issues there. Uh, back then, we barely did have any good on and off ranks in Europe. Coinbase, for example, was only in the US. I mean, 2013, you have to imagine, was still like Mt. Gox 90% trading volume. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we also thought, okay, like the very first step what you need is, okay, that's a proper exchange. But there, again, of course, yeah, German regulations, please put up 5 million euro security bond mm -hmm. and actually value an attacks and so on and so forth. And that ended up basically like after 18 months and 13,000 euros paid to lawyers and that was all we did. Mm -hmm. And we just have to sit there and wait and wait and wait. And we said like, screw this, uh, let's just take the software which we have built in the meanwhile and go for other markets which are somewhat more welcoming. And that's where we come back to Vietnam. Uh, 
due to some family ties which I had here and also of course was generally one of the rising markets here in Southeast yeah. Asia. Um, if you look at the demographics, like 70% of the population below 30 years old after India's strongest GDP growth uh, over the last decade worldwide. Mm -hmm. Very open to new technology, which is also very different to like Germany, which mm -hmm. is like, I mean, when we just came back two months ago to, to Frankfurt, you still have like within the city center at the same place, it's like you don't get any 3G connection on your phone. After 10 years, it's still the same. Mm. Like in the middle of the banking center of, of mainland Europe, uh, uh, right here in Vietnam, I mean, even go to the countryside or whatever, it just works. Mm. So the, the frontier of Vietnam is, is where you decide to um, kind of put down some roots. And part of those family ties are also here in the room. Uh, if you want to uh, introduce yourself in background a little bit, uh, where, first, where, where are you from in Vietnam? Are you from Ho Chi Minh? Yeah, from here, like born and raised in Saigon. So, okay. like, uh, my hometown is here, has been spending all my life here. And just like Dominic, I just got into the call slightly after him about summer 2013, mm -hmm. when the price about 70 euro. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so this is. <laughs> so, like, so look at how it is now. Yeah. But funny when we talk about it, because, you know, like, at that time, after six months already, Dominic already bamming, bamming me with a lot of news about Bitcoin. And to me, it's like something weird and unreal and virtual, something that I don't understand, you know. And that summer when I was in Europe, and that was my last 70 euro of my pocket. I just <laughs> wow. wanted to buy something nice to bring home, you know, oh, that's some great. dresses uh -huh. or some purse or something like that. And he said that, no, we use that to buy it. <laughs> Hell no, I'm not doing that. Uh -huh. So I don't know what happened. We compromised and he bought Bitcoin. So he kind of stole the amount from me. Sounds like a nice compromise. <laughs> you want to buy Bitcoin. Yeah, I buy Bitcoin. And it's like, I never saw that price again. Yeah, so, yeah, for sure. So once in a while, he's right. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And y'all are married, I guess, to, to yes. give some more context to that. Yeah. Uh, and and you're, the, you're the CEO of Bitcoin Vietnam. So y'all set up um, in Vietnam uh, 2013. You, you come, you kind of have the original founding team together, um, a, a partner from Germany. You decide to set up an entity here and mm -hmm. uh, start rolling. What were the first products that you were thinking about? Yeah, I mean, the first product was similar to like what I was thinking uh, back then, in, in, in which we had in Germany before you think about all these fancy second layer applications and mm -hmm. whatever, you need to give people a way to get in there. So yeah. I just built a basic exchange product, which was like kind of Coinbase style uh -huh. brokerage. Back then, I mean, we started our research in Vietnam in like summer 2013, what's okay. going on here. And you spent some time in Vietnam before, obviously. Or... Yeah, I was, you know, was traveling already like five, six times or yeah. something before that. So I spent enough time here to have a feel for the market already. Yeah. Um, and there was nothing visibly going on in Vietnam after some digging we found out, okay, yeah, there's indeed some people trading and some mm -hmm. people mining, but they all keep it very hidden away because of course nobody wants to raise attention there. Yeah. Just, just want to take their money quietly and yeah, <laughs> don't raise right. attention for people who might want to have a cut from that. Yeah. Um, we decided then explicitly to take a bit different approach and just say, okay, we just go out there and say very clearly what we do. Uh -huh. Where some of like the other old school guys who were doing this all underground said like, "Are you crazy? Why are you doing this?" These are old school guys. Are these are these uh, expats who are in Vietnam doing this? Or actually, is that local, local yeah. guys. Uh, quite a few local guys who also were into it, but they just never saw the need and mm -hmm. to yeah get all the attention on them because in Vietnam that also sometimes means like yeah if you have all the attention on you, you are also the whipping boy if something goes wrong. Yeah. And you're also the first place uh, where you get asked then when things are going a bit like the wrong way. Sure, sure. You have to chip in basically. Yeah, not, not too different from China. You don't want to be that nail sticking out that's ready to get hammered down. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, so the community kind of touched a little bit. What does the Bitcoin community look like when you come initially? So there's kind of some sporadic 
activities, people doing their own stuff. Is there a meetup scene? Are there people getting together and kind of talking about the future? There was no community back then, uh -huh. so, uh, which also, for me, coming back from the community scene in Frankfurt, yeah. so I was a bit like frustrated because there's nobody around really to talk about it or meet people. Which was then like in 2014, I think it was like by roughly summer, and also we got the idea. Also, as a background, I moved into Vietnam fix uh, in like April or May 14. So, when we, the co co company was created, I was still actually in Frankfurt. Mm. Um, so, by summer, then started, must have been July, August, or something like this, uh, coming together with some of the other people living here thinking like, okay, we should also get some Bitcoin meetups going here yeah. because most bigger cities around the world had some Bitcoin meetups at yeah. times. Like, I didn't. So it was then like, Yana No, you might have heard about her. She's also yeah, a she writer. Yeah, for Bitcoin magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, she's not active really in the community anymore because also not married and has kids and so on and so forth. So not that much time anymore. But she mm -hmm. was one of the co-creators of the community here. And also a local student called Koa, now also not that active anymore because he has now a full-time job. So also pretty busy during the days. So from like the original community founding team, it's kind of just me left. But there's a couple of other guys now who also joined in. So we have now, I would say maybe half a dozen people who kind of like are actively helping to organize the meetups and everything. And yeah, then you have like, of course, a bunch of regulars who show up. Uh, Compared to Frankfurt nowadays, I think since 2016, we have no really weekly meetups going. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, just in some restaurant bar, maybe like once a month, roughly. We have also some speakers, or if you have somebody interested coming to town, luckily, like Saigon is kind of tourist attractive. Town, sure. So we have <laughs> people coming through now and then. Uh, had some of the bigger names of the, of the Bitcoin space here already. I mean, Probably Antonopoulos, the most well known. Um, Eric Moskai was here. Roger Ware back in the days also was here. Yeah, yeah. Hey. <laughs> uh, I mean, he's still coming to town, but of course, it's now all a bit more <laughs> difficult times than in the early times. Yeah. Um, Simon Nixon was here. It's no definitely stop on, the, stop on the, the, the route through Asia. Um, yeah. One of the stronger meetups. And we're, we're here for the five year anniversary of that. Uh, essentially, five year anniversary. Yes, of five year anniversary of Bitcoin Saigon. So, like, the first meetup was also actually quite difficult to organize because I said there were no other meetups, and we were trying to find some locations. We were running again and again into the issues, like, with the location. I was like, oh, this Bitcoin stuff, we don't know, maybe it's illegal, maybe the police will raid the space. <laughs> and so, we had a few locations really backing out and telling us, like, nah, they don't want to take the risk. Thing. All right, yeah. Luckily, then, Officios, which is like a French Vietnamese co working space, outsourcing firm, so mix of this, they then had the balls, um, had the balls to just say, okay, let's do it at our place. So, we had the first meetup there in November 2014, five mm -hmm. years ago, and it was actually quite a good success. We had like 50 people actually turning up for the very first meetup. Um, yeah, we also had some funny people in the back, which seemed to look from the authorities if like uh, okay. <laughs> any revolution is planned or something here, but it seems like, um, yeah, was fine. So <laughs> we haven't seen them coming back. Yeah, and she was asking really... some questions about like, is it illegal and government approval on this? Do you have like license and stuff like that? So it's like, I don't know, but I answer most of the questions and all of the questions, and it seems like this saw no risk. Okay. Yeah, so, so saw that it's not some secret group trying to overturn <laughs> the government here or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you're, so you're kind of developing the, the you know, community uh, here at the same time as kind of your first business line, which is kind of being that coin base for Vietnam. Yes. And your focus kind of siloed on Vietnam for that service. It's not... Yes. Uh, it's right. still focused on Vietnam. Uh, that's also where the majority of our customer base is on. Over the years, we have then expanded the product line also considerably. Um, I mean, we have also our proper trading platform like Coinbase. Yeah. Well. It's Coinbase Pro. We run a couple of ATMs also here in town. That's why I said conglomerate earlier. You've got like five different business lines now. Yeah. <laughs> 
uh, have a remitted service, which is pretty useful, like it's a digital domain, don't even have a bank account here, you can just send bitcoins or some of the other mm -hmm. popular cryptocurrencies to it, and we cash it out to the AD for you. Uh, we have an OTC trade there, so I mean, if people come to us, we want to buy larger amounts, that's also something we can handle. I don't know, what else do we have? I mean, we have really like the whole range basically sure. covered now where you exchange the local currency into to Bitcoin and sure. the different customer segments. But I mean, what's also interesting, of course, is how the liquidity situation changed. So like when we started out, we really had to buy the Bitcoins basically abroad because there was mm -hmm. just not enough liquidity here. Um, when we started a remittance service in like 2015, we had to tell our partners like, hey, please don't send more than like $10,000 because mm -hmm. otherwise we have trouble settling this year in the local market. Yeah. Nowadays, uh, I mean, if you send us like whatever, a million dollars or something, that's something we can have really in the mm. local market. That's mm. something that's changed, obviously, mostly like 2017. Yeah. Uh, that's where the majority of the inflow happened. But yeah, it's also interesting to see there the changes. Like when I think like the early struggles we had 2014, like, oh, somebody wants to buy 10 bitcoins, which back then was still like quite a bit of money. Uh, that started bringing us with sweating already. Like, okay, how do we settle this? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, nowadays, not an issue. Really. <laughs> the growth of the industry and the growth of the business. It's good. Um, so, back to, so that's, that's the business now. Back to 14, um, when you kind of start with this uh, uh, you know, exchange product. Uh, are you, you're thinking about it as, hey, how do we serve the Bitcoin community here and grow the Bitcoin community here? Are you also thinking about, thinking about it and hey, these are kind of pain points in the economy. How can Bitcoin fix some of these things? Um, you know, I guess remittances were kind of a popular use case talked about at that time. You have know, businesses popping up all over Southeast Asia to kind of target that. Uh, I think you roll something out uh, for that use case. So how are you thinking about kind of the pain points that Bitcoin can solve at that point? Um, I mean, there are definitely pain points. I think they are growing, actually, because, like, the traditional banking system gets harder and harder to use. Just this year, also, there was a lot of new regulations introduced, which make it, yeah, incredibly much harder for, like, foreigners, for example, based here in Vietnam, to, to use the banking system to do just the basic job, what you would expect yeah. a bank to provide to you. So those, those use cases that, that was popular uh, for, for people to say, hey, this is a good use case, but then you've only seen really a few companies that have been su successful in uh, kind of growing a business with that, and you're saying, hey, this is actually becoming more of a problem in Vietnam now. Yeah, so, I mean, if you take, for example, the remittance use case, I saw a lot of companies also going into the space with very naive views also where they are target market and so it is and how it works. And of course, we also didn't know everything we know nowadays about the space, but mm -hmm. we had at least like a rough idea. And for example, people always say like, oh, Vietnam is like one of the top remittance countries globally if you look at the, at the flows there. But that's only the official numbers. The actual flows are much larger and they're mm -hmm. more going through like these underground systems. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to compete on like the main channels. Like yeah. you have large overseas population in the US, in Australia, so in Europe, it's very hard to compete there with these markets because it's very cheap to send money, for example, from the US back to Vietnam mm -hmm. because the transaction flows are mostly going outward to these countries. Uh -huh. Because we have capital controls here, so sure. you officially can't send money out of the country, but these havala like systems, they just kind of swap it out. And they make their money then from the people who want to transfer the money out of Vietnam which means to make it very cheap to send yeah, it back yeah, into Vietnam. Yeah. And there's no way you can really compete if you can afford it and just charge like half a percent and deliver cash to the door within mm. the hour here and say, oh, yeah. how do you want to beat that? I so mean, that's what, systems what, which have been built up over 30, 40 years. The infrastructure on the ground there, yeah. 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 Um, but there are other channels which are interesting and where Bitcoin really can come to help. For example, we visited uh, in 2014 Israel, for the inside bitcoins there actually also at met their Vietnamese girl also which was living with one of the Israeli bitcoiners and there's only like 400 Vietnamese in Israel so they don't have these underground networks in place they are forced to use Western Union charging them 10% because Western Union also knows there's no competition there so we can charge the high prices 
And there, obviously, like Bitcoin can make a difference if you just buy your Bitcoins in Israel and then transfer the money this way. So for like these channels where like the underground money remitters are not very active, um, or also where you have channels where the flow is very one-sided, like there's a lot of Vietnamese migrant workers, maybe in some countries where there's not many outflows going otherwise. US, Australia, I mean, a lot of Vietnamese send money over there because they have their kids studying there or they buy some real estate or whatever. Mm -hmm. But there might be other places where Vietnamese people go to work. So you have a lot of inflows back into Vietnam then. But when Vietnamese people don't invest basically the savings. So these are then the markets which are going to be more interesting. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Um, and your, your uh, business line for that is cash to VN. Yes. Yeah. It's only into Vietnam since we have the capital controls here. I mean, we are not officially offering any services which provide outbound remittances. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That we can't directly help with. Yeah. And, and so uh, kind of back in that 2014, kind of 15 time range, uh, really you start the business kind of in a, a bear market essentially. Uh, and have kind of come through a nice bull market and are now we're kind of wherever we are now, which uh, is probably debatable. Um, so how, how, kind of back to the, in the, in the 14, 15 days, how are you thinking about the competitive landscape of these businesses that are popping up around Asia? So you have kind of mentioned earlier, you have remittance companies popping up and you know, Philippines and, and other places. You have exchanges popping up in mainland China and Korea. How, how are you thinking about growing your business in the context of where does Vietnam sit in Asia? Uh, you're, are you, throughout the, the history of the company, kind of focused on, hey, let's serve this market and own this market? Yeah, I think Vietnam is in itself a very interesting and large yeah. enough market. I mean, if you just look at like the traffic stats in some of the largest exchanges around the world, like Vietnam is almost always like in the top 10 there. Yeah. We have 100 million people here, so I mean, it's not that small. Um, but it's also, I mean, back then there came a lot of business that also like, okay, let's just go to Southeast Asia and like own this whole reach. It's not easy. Every yeah. country has yeah. a lot of struggles to just own this one market. And that's also something where we think like at the moment it makes still sense for us mostly there to focus on the Vietnamese market. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. While, I mean, if you're stretching yourself too thin, I mean, yeah, you might have a presence there, but you don't really get anything anything done over there if you don't have all the connections and everything. So people shouldn't underestimate the difficulties to operate in these markets. For sure. Um, and how, how big is your team here now, by the way? Um, I think in total we have roughly a dozen people or so in the yeah. team. So like some customer support help, marketing people. Um, we have some people working just on the ATMs now. Yeah. Initially, this was just kind of run on the side when we had just like the first four machines here. So you could kind of mention one side, but now we have another couple of dozen machines or something yeah. coming. Oh, yeah. So, it's yeah, you're in the office now, but uh, it's ready to be deployed, I think. Uh, we will looking now also to get some machines deployed outside Ho Chi Minh City. So okay. that's also for us a bit like a pilot project to see how far we can take it there. Yeah, cool. Uh, so kind of get through the bear market, 14, 15, uh, 16, where we uh, kind of have uh, that kind of cycle um, happening. Can you take us to that time and uh, specifically to kind of how uh, government and regulators started to pay attention to the industry then? Um, what, like what was kind of a tipping point for them? And then also kind of how are you dealing with regulators uh, throughout that process. We have a team that's some local, some uh, expat, uh, kind of just describe that time and, and context. Sure, so I mean, just like the bear market short, I mean, obviously it was a bit frustrating back at the time because we had to hold also our own stack of Bitcoins to serve the <laughs> customers quick. And like at 14, it was like every month, okay, we made this this much operational profit, but actually the Bitcoins we hold lost like half oh, yeah. of the value again. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, that was a bit frustrating. Like in 2017, you luckily had a bit reversed in a way. Mm -hmm. um, as for the regulators, I mean, for a long time, they just tried to kind of avoid the topic. Um, I mean, they tried like the public perception, like, okay, it's kind of shady, possibly mm -hmm. illegal, whatever. Um, but they didn't, and until now, there's no real regulation yet around it. Uh, 
the only thing you had done from coming from the state bank at some point is that okay you can't use this for payments similar to like foreign currencies or gold or whatever gold was like a big deal here like around 2008 when we had the last mm. inflation push here where like you had like 20 percent inflation or something annually so people were just settling their real estate mm. deals in gold and the state bank tried to push back on this um so yeah you can't be really use it for payments but otherwise still that was, I think that was the, the uh, piece of information that kind of got most publicity in the west was hey this you can't use it for payments that was yes. 2017 Yes, a lot of media also like wrongly reported and get oh, I've a bad Man, Bitcoin, Bitcoin yeah, yeah. and so on. Like, there's still people even now coming to us like, oh, didn't Vietnam bad Bitcoin? Mm-hmm. Like, it's illegal. I mean, you know, there's a, a lot of bad reporting also in the space where there's like no fact checking whatsoever. It just gets a big yeah. headline out there. Um, yeah, but in fact, I mean, it was never illegal, never banned. At the moment, it's still unregulated. As for the regulatory process, so in 2016, we also saw the need then to kind of start opening up the dialogue here a bit more for which, like, out of the board, also out of the local community. Mm-hmm. We had, like, I think the idea in December 15, and one of the meetups, hey, let's do some a bit larger conference, which turned out to be then yes. <laughs> June 2016, Blockfin Asia, yeah, first <laughs> larger conference, which we had here in Vietnam, also like quite a few people coming down from, from internationally. I mean, the website is still up there. You can see like Simon Dixon, Roger Ware, Tone Ways, and so on. They all came down here to support the cause, basically. Yeah, and, and, and part of your uh, thought process going into this is, hey, let's let's put this in the face of regulators in, a, in yes. the right way, try to get them to think about it. Yes, we had the head of the payments department of the State Bank of Vietnam joining us, which was a lot of effort to mm-hmm. have this person coming down from Hanoi. Yeah. Because first of all, normally they expect you to come up to Hanoi, <laughs> right? coming down to say, oh, imagine. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, dealing to the State Bank of Vietnam, that's the, the central banking infrastructure. Yes. Mm-hmm. So dealing with these kind of people, I mean, that makes like organizing such a conference like three times more difficult than mm-hmm. it's anyway already when you have all the international logistics coming in. I mean, organizing this week's anniversary is also a lot of work, but compared to like 2016, definitely quite yeah. a bit less but, stress. But, and there's a lot of pressure at the time. Hey, you got to put the face of the industry forward well into these folks. Yes. Let's see if we can get some yes. possible regulation. I mean, I got the word from the person who helped us to get that really the, the guy to come down. This is going to fail. You are done here. <laughs> oh my gosh. So it was his words. And we knew that also from like how things work here. Sure. That, yeah, we can't screw this up. Now. Yeah, and how things work here. Uh, Vietnam is a you know a communist country, uh, similar to China, uh, still. Um, and so these these guys who are in the central bank um, and regulating these markets, uh, it's not. Uh, all right, so, so he, sorry, so he, he comes to the conference. How's it going? Yeah, so he comes to the conference. Um, luckily, I mean, we knew that like after two and a half years or so operating here already a bit, how to play the game here. So, yeah, we knew what like his favorite wine brand was. And so, okay. and so he got some <laughs> can, nice can, can you talk about this? <laughs> That's an interesting piece to, to play in the game. So you're, you're, are there, uh, is the central banking uh, kind of team in Ho Chi Minh? Like you're you're in touch with them monthly? You're taking yeah. I mean, we are in touch regularly with all yeah. the regulatory bodies, which are kind of uh, relevant for the industry. So the state bank, the Ministry mm-hmm. of Justice, the Department of Public Security. Yeah. Um, so we have since early on actively also looked for outreach. That said, people are okay. We are here. We are accessible. Yeah. So yeah. If there's anything. Just Come to us. Yeah. Can talk to us, go to whatever, rate the place and do any, any yeah. other things. Be transparent, be open. Yeah. Yes. So um, that was one of our approaches here because, yeah, I mean, we operate in Vietnam. It has its own roots and you need to kind of live by it if you want to run a business here. And that's going to be kind of a you know, daunting thing for uh, you know, Westerners coming in to start a company. You have local co founders also, which, which helps. But uh, you know, Vietnam's a scoring market. And it's, it's a place where, uh, you know, it's open for business. But there haven't been a ton of other uh, outside businesses that have come and, and kind of gone through that process and, and done well. Uh, I guess any, any insights into, into that more, I guess? 
I mean, Vietnam is definitely a very interesting market mm. to enter, but it's also a very challenging market to yeah. enter. And I mean, the worst thing you can do is probably just come here waving around money because mm. there will always be people happy to take it <laughs> and you probably don't get the results you expect. Yeah. Especially if, if you come from like the Western yes. culture yeah. where you have like a different kind of expectations how things work. Yeah, it's very easy to kind of fall flat on your face in yeah. your attempts there. Yeah. Um, I think that was for us as a company and still is for us as a company that we have like this kind of mixed founding team um, and that we have like also within the team here like partially foreigners and partially mm -hmm. like locals it really helps us on the one side okay get things done how they need to get done in a local way while on the other side also have like the wider perspective of the industry and also on, like certain business ethics and standards which make you compatible basically working there with partners from outside Vietnam. Right. Because like even if you just look, okay, who can we work with here in Vietnam? It's not necessarily easy to find another partner who is like kind of playing on the same level yeah. which you would expect like as a Western company. I think I maybe had one experience in particular with, with that that uh, uh, we can get, get to at the end of this. Uh, but uh, but yeah, that makes sense. Uh, And so, um, so you're, you're kind of playing the game with, with uh, regulators, being open, being transparent, you do this event, successful event. Uh, and by the way, that's after the uh, main commerce in Asia had been inside Bitcoins, which kind of folds through the bear market. So you're, that's kind of the event of the summer in Asia. Yes. Um, uh, and then we hit uh, kind of the, the real bull market. So, so what uh, kind of take us to that phase where, where things start to get really interesting? So, yeah, I mean, when the bull market came along, I mean, it started already showing its signs like in 2016 around, I remember like we still had like a meetup in 2015, late 15, when it was like just about to break out then there to this $500 and so on. Yeah. But it was still like a $200, it was like two, three weeks before this, this move up. Uh, also, just made one last word to the conference. I mean, we saw it was a success, basically, because we had one guy. You might remember these these, these gimmicks, Satori coins from from Japan, uh -huh. where they had like one mini mini Bitcoin printed on like these casino chips. So one of our guests from Japan brought a bunch of them and handed them out at the conference. Like before the conference, everybody was like very very regarding like oh bitcoin you can't mention this and you should put it off any marketing materials so we had to go really there and just search replace just blockchain 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 <laughs> everywhere yeah. yikes yeah including um that's maybe a nice side story at some point uh the very first feature film for mainstream massive cinema around bitcoin was actually made in vietnam is that right so if you have seen it bitcoin haste Okay. It's kind of like Ocean's Eleven style movie, oh, but locally that? here in Vietnam, and it's actually quite good okay. because when we when, when I first it's time. nothing like a Bitcoin movie, you know. It's just like an entertainment with like a shooting and chasing and kind of yeah. Hollywood style movie. But when I heard about Bitcoin movie, it was it's another documentary, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know. It's actually quite interesting. Cool, cool, yeah, yeah. And so, when we do the license for the event, that we had to rename it into Blockchain Haste. Yeah, yeah. Just to avoid the evil world. Blockchain Haste, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that hurt your heart, too, especially as a, as a, a real Bitcoiner, so. Uh, sympathies for that, that time. Yeah, but I mean, we saw it was a success basically when like the guy from the same bank also got his coin, smiled about it, and he saw it the same moment like how all the Vietnamese business leaders and the young upstarts, which also were in the room, were looking to the front table and see, okay, the guy kind of approves it. Yeah. And the next day, all these people who told us just before, oh, don't mention it, don't mention it, were going out there on Facebook and everything like, oh, I got my first Bitcoin. <laughs> That's and, great, like, yeah. That was like this this one crucial moment, basically. Where yeah. Okay, yeah. It was like working out okay. the way we wanted it to work out. Um, yeah, so and then bull market started approaching. We kind of got, let's say, almost a bit swept away what happening with all these ICOs and whatever because 
yeah, we were thinking initially already like, okay, that's all kind of rubbish ideas and stupid. Right. So we didn't really participate in this stuff, uh, but that's where like suddenly all the action was also happening. Right. Obviously, we got also much more inflow and users. Uh, the usual scaling problems which the exchange had around the world, we also had them here that suddenly you had so many inquiries and you couldn't handle at some point anymore. The user inflow then of course, end of the year, end of the bull market, and also where you had issues with like the transaction backlog on the Bitcoin mm -hmm. network, where suddenly the Bitcoin transaction were like $50 and it took sometimes two days to clear. That was especially annoying because we had all the new people also joining and mm -hmm. we didn't have any clue how it works. Right. So like 95% of your customers bought tickets, which is a ripoff and where's right. Bitcoin. Right. Like very stressful, but of course also we made some good money at this time where mm -hmm. like I mean this company was for the longest time really completely self-funded by us mm -hmm. uh, because there were no people uh, willing to take the risk to fund a Bitcoin company in Vietnam right. I mean that's <laughs> it's already very hard to find normal startup in this yeah. Vietnam yeah. especially five years ago yeah. I mean that's also now easy now. and also five years ago to find investors for a Bitcoin company or something <laughs> And then there was just no match for, for this. Right. So it was really self-funded for the longest time. You bootstrap grinding through bear markets. Yes. Just yeah. get by how you can. And then, uh, yeah, 2017, that partly was then kind of, okay, now it starts paying off. Right. Finally, a bit like all the hard work we did. So also our one co-founder was able to move finally also with us over here to Vietnam. Um, yeah, so I mean, it was financially good time, of course, stressful, but I mean, yeah, that's that's how it is when right. good business is coming. Um, yeah, otherwise, like this this whole ICO space, of course, uh, put like the wrong focus. Also, I would say of like the public right. attention. A lot of people started and losing a lot of money going into 2018 because they invested into all these wrong focus for the community. And and also, does does the government start to look at this and say, hey, this is a problem with ICOs? Yes. I mean, we we had, for example, in summer 2017 already some meetups here with, made for the local community at the Bitcoin Saigon event. Also, like why ICOs there is mostly right. no fundamentals. We also explained clearly, like why the Ethereum price, for example, right now is just pumped up through these ICOs. That it's basically all the people buying just this Ethereum to look it up these ICOs. And you need to have an everlasting cycle of new ICOs coming so the old ones can cash out. But once this yeah. stops working, so you're trying to speak the truth. But uh, when, when yeah, no, 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 uh, yeah. I mean, the guy we did this with wraps up some of the popular fintech blocks here. And he has also lived like uh, through the 99 internet bubble. I yeah, mean, yeah. I was aware of this when I was just 15 or so. So I wasn't myself invested in the markets compared to him. So he also like told how it was back then, like all the historical mm -hmm. comparisons. But yeah, I mean, if people have just dollar signs in their eyes, they don't want to hear to this. Yeah. So, uh, early 2018 came around. You had the, a lot of these scams blowing up. Uh, one of the larger ones which made, I think, also quite a bit of international headlines was like this Bitcoin, iPhone thing. Is it? Is that, is that yeah, international? It's very big I think it Vietnam. was covered quite internationally. So where it was reported like six hundred million dollar loss. I mean, it was from our research what we understand roughly maybe thirty million dollar which got lost there. Six hundred million was just like the amount people were promised to get yeah. paid out at some point. Mm. Uh, still pretty big. People were protesting here in the streets, mm. uh, which also I mean you know how it works here. The government doesn't like to lose face. So they had to take some action, which hurt us then because we are the guys sticking out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So we had. So it doesn't matter that you're, you know, at these events. Yeah, we have to go with it. It's you're the face of what they're saying is this industry. And yeah, it's, it's they're, just they're that we Bitcoin take action. And, yeah, yeah. We take action. So we got our domain suspended there, um, or make domain Bitcoin. Many yeah. months. Yeah. Yeah. So the domain was. Bitcoin.vn. That's Bitcoin.vn. Yes. That's the <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we're still working. Uh, maybe getting it back someday. But uh, we moved by now, of course, to an international domain. But hurt, of course, the business tremendously there because right. we didn't really have time to prepare for. What is, what is that process? So they just they just uh, give you notice one day. 
that you're oh, one, hour, one, one hour. One hour. Wow. So we got the email at two wow. p.m. at three p.m. We shut down. Wow. What do you do for that hour? Do you? The, the reasons were given that we run an unlicensed news network and an unlicensed social media network, which was just our made up network. No, it's just like our our company blog where we had like. Oh no. Oh. Every two weeks, maybe an interview with one of our partners, or hey, we have yeah. created this and this. One company blog, one. yeah. And the unlicensed social media network was that we had a comment button below. <laughs> the, ah, so, comments. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We had maybe like six, six comments or something over oh, the last 12 months, but uh, yeah. Uh, so you take your domain, Bitcoin.vn. Yes. That's the best domain in the country. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, we saw the traffic drop mm. heavily, of course, because yeah. I mean, even if you move it then all onto an international domain, I mean, if you have no time to notify your customers, you could be just a phishing scam, basically. Right, right, so, for sure. Uh, and like the immediate drop was like 80% of the traffic loss. Yeah. So it's more just thing I've done. we got yeah. it and slowly started getting it back, but it was like definitely hurtful for the financial bottom line. Yeah. It's just doing business again. Yeah, you know. yeah. Roller coaster rides. Mm -hmm. Oh man! <clears throat> so that's that's uh, uh, early mid twenty eighteen. Mm -hmm. um, that's also the time then when like regulators started then getting more active because I mean yeah back then like Bitcoin everything huge topic so they tasked the Ministry of Justice then to do some regulatory draft proposal leading like the efforts coordinating all the other ministries. Um, it's a process still ongoing. Initial plan was to have it ready by summer this year. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it didn't happen yet, so they take more time. Nobody wants to make the wrong call there. I and mean, right now, they also don't feel as much pressure anymore, which I think is not the worst approach. I mean, when they started out, they basically had like three options on the table. One was like China, like breakdown, ban everything, kind of. Um, the second one, just keep it as it is, like this gray area, everything a bit in wake kind of officially discouraged but no official regulation around it or the third one that have some official regulatory framework mm -hmm. so i mean right now we are still in two i don't think option one is going to happen again with what we have seen over the last couple of years i just at some point we will move to option three but they take their time i mean one thing i have to say where it's at least so far more positive than for example germany is that they really have regularly um, some seminars and whatever where they get input from like the industry. Okay, and and so you're you're uh, kind of an information point for them along with other folks in the industry. Yes, and, so, and y'all are regularly having uh, just in September they had the last one now in Hanoi, which was like again a bit larger private workshop with some people from the industry. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean that's ongoing. They really try to understand it properly. Which is very different, for example, than like Germany, where they basically just said, "Oh, we just don't mm -hmm. want this stuff here." Mm -hmm. And are, there, are they now differentiating between Bitcoin and, uh, or, or you know, maybe something that's decentralized versus something that's? Uh... I'm not sure if the understanding is deep enough there yet, but I think they have definitely made some progress in this regard. Um, Understanding what's more okay, what is like kind of what is more asset backed or what is like a proper cryptocurrency. I'm not sure if they have all the nuances really figured out, like if like you have it if you're really deep into the sure. industry. But it's not at this level anymore, like when it started out and like all the media they just lumped like one coin and bitcoin or whatever, everything the same cryptocurrency somehow. Uh, I mean they definitely are making good progress they understand it is better so I hope that at some point we will see then a more sensible approach there not get lumped in together with all these other scams which are running around up here yeah and uh, I guess Bitcoin or uh, the market in Vietnam more broadly so uh, you all uh, kind of set up shop here about six years ago uh, you kind of mentioned earlier that there wasn't a, you know a very uh, you know good uh, ecosystem for like startup funding and things like that uh, obviously, uh, it's been one of the faster growing economies over the last six years. Uh, just the market in Vietnam now. Uh, how's it? Uh, where is it today versus back then? That uh, you know, I wrote in a grab. Digital payments are everywhere. What's the what's kind of the market like now? I guess. 
Okay, I mean, if you look like at the general startup fintech market, it's all definitely evolving. So, I mean, when I came here like 2014, it was very, very, very early. You didn't mm -hmm. even have like these co working spaces, like these general kind of startup infrastructure was really lacking back then as well. Um, that has evolved quite fast over the last couple of years. I mean, it's still early in the ecosystem, but back then it was like kind of completely, you had to do like yeah. all the groundwork. Now yeah. you have like several locations of like Circo, you have three flags, you have WeWork also in power, I don't know how much longer, but uh, <laughs> uh, so, I mean, you have also a lot more interest also from funds and so on who are looking to invest. It's still not easy because of all the red tape around it, but at least they're looking into it. They know mm -hmm. there's opportunities here in Vietnam, which like five years ago, barely anybody really was seeing the potential here yet. Um, so that's moving forward. I mean, the crypto part is, you see, of course, Some of these companies like, okay, we do also something with blockchain. Most of the time it doesn't really make much sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but really like actual crypto companies like us is still a more sensible topic because it's unregulated here. Mm -hmm. So there is still a bit like, okay, we don't know if we want to touch this. Mm -hmm. yet. So I mean, this is also where like regulatory uncertainty to a degree might be a bit hurtful for the yeah. growth of the local industry but on the other hand of course it helps you also kind of if you know how to navigate it while yeah players from overseas might not be willing yet to jump into this market. Certainly managed to already have that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I mean everything has its two sides there basically. Yeah and uh, your, your business on today we, we kind of uh, went through them a little bit uh, what, what, are you, what are you kind of uh, most focused on now as a uh, hey, this is a growth point for us? Um, I mean, one of the things which we are investing in right now is growing a bit like the ATM network, mm. see if we can uh, do this from like, just like this kind of very side business into like an actual yeah. business line really of, of, of the company. Um, looking also to improve the trading, trading platform, which we have because it's a bit dated. Mm. Um, so that's, that's one of the targets for 2020. And otherwise, like in 2020, really look that we make more use also like in our product designs of what like the protocol actually has to offer. Okay. So, I mean, you see a lot of companies or like a lot of like fly-by-night exchanges here opening up who just mm -hmm. try to copy like Biden style. Okay, we just mm -hmm. throw up some exchange here and list all kind of mm -hmm. random bullshit projects on there. So they go more like, vertical lists as many rubbish projects on the exchange as possible for people to gamble on. What we think is probably makes more sense to focus like on a few things people actually are interested. I mean, we see it in our trade flows. I mean, people are not really interested to buy some random ICO tokens. Mm -hmm. It's most Bitcoin. Ethereum has also some traction, of course. USDT, and that's basically it. I mean, that's like the, the stuff people use. Right, right. And then I think for us, it makes just more sense, okay, improve like the user experience, get some yeah. technological advantage there by look, okay, what else can we really do there with, with the protocol to build better products rather than like, yeah, waste all your dev resources on maintaining some random garbage coins, which nobody is really yeah. interested hey, in. Anyway. The, the Bitcoin company, it's all your Bitcoin Vietnam. Yes. So, I mean, yeah, it's one of our goals really for 222. Yeah, focus even more there. On are you bullish on Lightning products. here? Do you like, uh, what kind of developments on Bitcoin are you? Um, Lightning also still pretty early stage here, but we kind of supported, we had like at the, the community actually, even if like officially it's banned, but a demo at one of the pizza places here, where okay. we, which we frequently frequent in August, where people could pay for their pizza with Lightning. So yeah, yeah. Working there with, uh, Company which is like by Canadian MidQ, Neutron Pay, which Neutron Pay, yeah, yeah. So they offer like Lightning payments, and we help them with the conversion to the cool. ID. So that's something we are also working on to make this a bit more mainstream accessible. Both cool. the business lines coming. I mean, payments as that is still a tricky space here in Vietnam, right? But yeah, there, there we see also potential to make it more useful because yeah, Bitcoin itself is. Well, like your visa payments, maybe not the right to. Mm -hmm. So, 
let's see if we get this working. We actually have um, for the community also a plan to set up like just for the community a lightning node, mm. which is sponsored also by Neutron Pay, by us and by two, three other companies which are related to, to the, the Bitcoin cycle okay. community. So that hopefully soon we are able then just to send around as I told she's to settle the bills. Yeah, yeah, that's great. It's a nice, nice uh, community feature for sure. Yeah, I mean, it needs to start out somewhere. I mean, you can have all the talks about Lightning Network or whatever and so forth. And every three months somebody talks about it, how it's evolving, but if nobody's ever really using it. You could agree more. Yeah, yeah, so, and I think like the community is like a good space where you have any way that people are interested in to just tinker around with it, get some experience, get also some feedback. That's where it can kind of then spread from if you start having also good user experiences there. Yeah, totally agree. Perfect. So finish off. What's you know, uh, you know Saigon's a, a stopping point on kind of the, the Asia tour for Bitcoiners coming through. What's what's uh, the one restaurant you recommend for anybody coming through Saigon? Surprise, surprise one there. I mean, probably people would prefer to eat more of the Vietnamese food. I guess if they just come through, and I'm not so well worse because I have the best Vietnamese food at home. <laughs> hey, there you go. Yeah, uh, Vietnamese what's, food. What should people go for? What's a good recommendation? We have like all kind of only good stuff here. What only good stuff? Yeah. Okay, come to come to come to Ho Chi Minh Saigon Food Scene. Thanks, thanks, thanks for all time. It's been good. I know you kind of got to uh, roll ups and stuff. Now. Yes. So if people come to Saigon, I mean definitely check out also like the community pages, weekly mm-hmm. meetups. I'm most of the time also there if I'm not sort of on travel. Uh, that's a good place to get in touch with like a local Bitcoiners here. It's on Twitter, Facebook. Yeah, we'll, we'll have those in the, uh, yeah. the so what, what, what is your Twitter handle? My Twitter handle is just Dominic Weil, so that's how At Dominic Weil? Yeah. Right. And then uh, Bitcoin Vietnam and Bitcoin Saigon for the, for the sure. community. Yeah, we'll head it all over to you for the show notes. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks. Uh, it was fun walking through kind of the history of Bitcoin here um, for, you know, from the, the founders of, of the Bitcoin conglomerate. So I'll have to check in as, as things develop, but appreciate the time. Thanks a lot, John. Thanks, John. Thanks. Quick reminder, all of the content in this episode is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. Nothing contained in this presentation constitutes a solicitation, recommendation, endorsement, or offer by BTC Media, the Let's Talk Bitcoin Podcast Network, or any third-party service provider to buy or sell any securities or other financial instruments.